the Wild West. It's the fundamental mythology of the United States of America. The iconography and imagery we've chosen to tell the story of who we are as a people and as a country. It's a mythology so enduring that depictions of it stretch from the yellowed pages of dime novels written while the West was still being won to the controllers and keyboards of gamers playing Red Dead Redemption 2. In films from the Edison Company's The Great Train Robbery in 1903 through Netflix's The Harder They Fall last autumn, the splendor and the danger of the American West has captivated the imagination of generations. The great heroes of the American West are just as familiar. There are the great lawmen like Wild Bill Hickok and Wyatt Earp, and the outlaws they face like Jesse James and Billy the Kid. There are gamblers like Doc Holliday, scouts like Buffalo Bill, and warriors like Crazy Horse and Geronimo. These names, these men, have become more than historical figures, fiction trumping fact and their legends superimposed on their lives. Each was a real man, but in the telling and retelling of their tales, they've taken on the status of folk heroes, as much Paul Bunyan or Pecos Bill as William F. Cody or James Butler Hickok. Yet when we take a step back from the individuals and the individual stories woven into the tapestry of the American West, a curious theme emerges. Picture a meeting of these great Western men as they're depicted in movies and on TV. Standing there are the great scout Buffalo Bill, the deadly lawman Wild Bill, the gambler Doc Holliday, and the outlaw Butch Cassidy. What are they wearing? Does Wild Bill have on a marshal's hat? Is Butch Cassidy wearing outlaw boots? Of course not. The wide-brimmed Stetson shading their eyes from the sun is a cowboy hat, and on their feet are tall leather cowboy boots. If the great men of the American West weren't cowboys, then how did the cowboy become the single most iconic figure of the American Western? The truth is, there was a famous cowboy who stood beside these men in real life and whose legacy is just as enduring, though his name has been nearly forgotten by the casual student of American history. In 1873, when Wild Bill Hickok was convinced to join a traveling stage show called The Scouts of the Plains, his co-stars were the aforementioned Bill Cody and a real-life cowboy named John Baker Omohundro. His friends called him Texas Jack. On stage, Cody and Hickok impressed crowds with tales of buffalo hunting on horseback and gunslinging in frontier towns, while Texas Jack thrilled with stories of wild stampedes and cattle rustlers told in his baritone Virginia drawl. He entertained packed halls, auditoriums, and theaters as he whirled his lasso overhead, the first man to turn that tool of the cowboy trade into an object of entertainment for fascinated audiences. Texas Jack was the first cowboy to rise to prominence in the American popular imagination, and his stage persona provided the foundation upon which the cowboy trope and literature and film would be built. To understand the impact of Texas Jack, and just how unlikely it was that the open-range cowboy should achieve such status and permanence in American pop culture, we should look back at the history of the cowboy, both the word and the profession. For much of American history, it was an insult to call a man a cowboy. During the American Revolution, cowboys were British loyalists who stole cattle and oxen from local farmers and delivered them to British troops. In 1779, Claudius Smith, the cowboy of the Ramapos, was hanged for his crimes after the governor of New York offered a $1,200 reward for his capture. The word cowboy remained unflattering well into the 1880s, when the San Francisco Examiner said that, quote, Cowboys are the most reckless class of outlaws in the wild country, infinitely worse than the ordinary robber. This was the era of the Cowboys of Cochise County, a particularly ruthless band of cattle rustlers and outlaws operating near Tombstone, Arizona, whose criminal activities were curtailed by the shootout at the O.K. Corral and subsequent Earp Vendetta ride. Our modern view of the cowboy has been shaped by time and several factors. The mid-1880s saw the expansion of the cattle industry from Texas across the entire West. American businessmen and wealthy investors from England, Ireland, Scotland, and the rest of Europe funded ranches, cattle, and cowboys, leading to one of the biggest economic booms in history. Their investments provided the foundation for America's dominance of the world's economy while simultaneously funding the development of cities and infrastructure across the West. 
Books like The Virginian by Owen Wister began to mythologize the cowboy, and literary giants from Zane Grey to Louis L'Amour followed. Hollywood gravitated to the cowboy and western stories from its earliest films well into the late 20th century. Western movies dominated the period following World War II, and cowboy stories dominated westerns. The greatest actors of multiple generations starred in westerns, from William S. Hart and Tom Mix to John Wayne and Clint Eastwood, Jimmy Stewart and Burt Lancaster to Idris Elba and Benedict Cumberbatch. Theodore Roosevelt traveled west in 1884, after the dual loss of his mother and his wife, to start a cattle ranch just north of Medora, North Dakota. He was indelibly shaped by the cowboy's lifestyle and the cowboys he befriended there. Returning in 1900 on a campaign swing with future President McKinley, he told locals, quote, I had studied a lot about men and things before I saw you fellas, but it was only when I came here that I began to know anything or measure men rightly. It was Roosevelt's time as a cowboy that would shape and refine the New York City boy into a Western man, and Teddy would not be the last politician to use the cowboy image of rugged independence to improve his standing with American voters. Movies, books, and even presidents have played a part in redefining the cowboy. But nothing has had more of an influence on the popular perception of the cowboy than one man, Buffalo Bill Cody. From its inception as Buffalo Bill and Dr. Carver's Rocky Mountain and Prairie Exhibition in 1883 until Cody's death in 1917, no entertainment was as prevalent or successful as Buffalo Bill's Wild West. The imagery and iconography of William F. Cody are indelibly tied to the profession of the cowboy, the rare job that Buffalo Bill, showman, scout, buffalo hunter, soldier, teamster, hotel proprietor, and even town planner, never held. In his book, Buffalo Bill's America, Louis Warren explains that Cody was, quote, an absentee ranch owner who was never a cowboy. Yet central to Cody's vision of the Wild West was what would become the defining icon of the Western man, the cowboy. For over 20 years, the culminating act of Bill Cody's show was listed in the program as Attack on a Settler's Cabin by Hostile Indians, repulsed by cowboys under the leadership of Buffalo Bill. With civilization at stake and the fate of the emblematic white family on the line, the group of heroes riding to the rescue was not composed of professional soldiers, but of cowboys, led by Buffalo Bill. When Cody, celebrated as a civilian scout for the military well before taking to the stage, rode toward engagements with hostile Sioux or Cheyenne on the plains of Nebraska and hills of the Dakota Territory, it was never in the company of cowboys, but of trained soldiers. Why, then, did Cody present the cowboy as the savior of the white family of civilization itself from the threat of savagery? The answer is the man Buffalo Bill called one of my dearest and most intimate friends, Texas Jack Omohundro. Texas Jack was a cowboy. In 1869, Bill had been placed in charge of the government's livestock at Fort McPherson when Texas Jack rode into town behind 4,000 head of Longhorn. Soon, the men were inseparable. They hunted together. They drank together. They scouted together and even hung wallpaper in Cody's new home together. Buffalo Bill wrote that they were pards of the plains for life. While Cody spent long weeks away from his family scouting with the 3rd Cavalry, Texas Jack slept in a spare room at the Cody home to ensure the safety of Bill's wife and children. On April 26, 1872, 150 years ago, Buffalo Bill's life was very nearly ended. Cody, who was serving as a scout for the 3rd Cavalry, was called to pursue a band of Miniconju Sioux horse thieves that had stolen horses from the Army's telegraph office at McPherson Station on the Union Pacific Railroad the night before. Buffalo Bill led Captain Charles Meinhold and his troops in pursuit across the Nebraska Prairie, following the signs of mounted warriors and stolen horses racing north towards the convergence of the Dismal and Middle Loop Fork Rivers. Cody believed the Miniconju and their horses were watering on the far side of the river and broke off from the body of soldiers with a few men to try to move around the warriors and prevent their escape. 
Cody and the soldiers with him quietly advanced on the warriors while the main force waited to mount a charge. But they were spotted just before they were ready to ambush their foes, and a firefight erupted. In his 1879 autobiography, Cody wrote that, quote, Two mounted warriors closed in on me and were shooting at short range. I returned their fire and had the satisfaction of seeing one of them fall from his horse. At this moment, I felt blood trickling down my forehead, and hastily running my hand through my hair, I discovered that I had received a scalp wound. The Indian who had shot me was not more than ten yards away. Cody yanked his rifle toward the man who had fired the shot, only to see him falling to the ground clutching at his chest. The warrior had been shot just as he took aim at Buffalo Bill, and if the marksman who'd fired at him had been anything other than deadly accurate, the bullet that grazed the famous scout's head that day would have found its mark and ended his life. There would be no Buffalo Bill dime novels, no Scouts of the Prairie stage show, no Buffalo Bill's Wild West. The museum dedicated to him and the city of his birth would not exist, nor would the center of the West Museum in Cody, Wyoming, the town that bears his name. There'd be no Doc Carver, Annie Oakley, or any of the other familiar Western icons that Buffalo Bill made famous as a showman. But because of the unerring aim of Buffalo Bill's closest friend, his life was saved and his legacy ensured. Because of his bravery that day, Bill Cody was awarded the Medal of Honor. The shot that had saved Buffalo Bill's life on the Nebraska prairie was fired from the rifle of his closest friend and constant companion, the cowboy Texas Jack. In their description of the encounter, a reporter for Cody's hometown newspaper, the North Platte Democrat, wrote that after Bill began firing at the Miniconju Raiders, quote, the remainder of the command hearing the fire came up at full jump, Texas Jack at the head. Texas Jack immediately let drive and brought his Indian down, and he finished by adorning his belt with his victim's scalp lock. Too much praise cannot be awarded to Captain Meinhold for his successful efforts. Lieutenant Lawson, with the gallant members of B Troop, did their duty nobly and well, for which they have justly earned the thanks of the community. In this connection, we would mention the efforts of our heroic friend, Texas Jack. Beside enjoying a reputation of a dead shot, He's well-skilled in the ways of the red man, and we're glad to know that his service has been retained by the government. Another newspaper reported that, quote, To Texas Jack was Buffalo Bill indebted for his life. The red thieves were pursued and overtaken by Bill and Jack, who each killed an Indian. A third redskin had just drawn a bead on Bill when Jack's quick eye caught the gleam of the shining barrel, and the next instant the noble red was on his way to the happy hunting ground, his passage from the sublunary sphere being expedited by a bullet from Jack's rifle at a distance of 125 yards. Texas Jack, the cowboy who very literally saved Buffalo Bill's life that April afternoon, was also his first dramatic partner and best friend. He was the first man Buffalo Bill telegrammed when his son, Kit Carson Cody, died. For three years on the Nebraska prairie, they rode, hunted, scouted, and camped together. For four years on theatrical stages from Maine to Texas, they performed over 550 shows together, not counting matinees. On stage, Texas Jack was the picture of the cowboy. His costume included the ever-present Stetson, tall black cavalry boots, fringed buckskin jacket open to reveal the Lone Star of Texas emblazoned on his shirt. He carried a lasso, rifle, revolver, and bowie knife, prepared for any danger that might come his way. More often than not in these stage shows, that danger took the form of hostile Indian warriors. These stage encounters, Texas Jack, locked in deadly combat against a tomahawk-wielding brave, proved so captivating that they spawned the Cowboys and Indians' backyard games of generations. The idea of cowboys fighting Indians on the outskirts of civilization is so firmly ingrained in the collective conscious as to seem cliched, but the reality of the cowboy stands in stark contrast with romantic depictions and stories and movies. By the time of the big Texas cattle drives of the late 1860s, herders meticulously avoided conflict with native tribes. This, despite the decimation of native populations between the cattle ranches of Texas and rail towns of Kansas, by disease, and the relegation of Native Americans to reservations. Ranch owners entrusted their cowboys with the care of their valuable stock. 
ensuring the value of their charges during transportation made cowboys more akin to modern truck drivers than leather-clad knights. Cattle drives along the Chisholm Trail, Goodnight Loving Trail, and others lasted only from the end of the Civil War in 1866 until the 1890s, when a combination of rail lines and hundreds of miles of barbed wire fence rendered the job of trail-driving cowboy obsolete. During the scant 30 years of cowboy primacy, swift streams swollen by rain, lightning, falls from horseback, and disease accounted for the majority of cowboy deaths. A cowboy was much more likely to draw his gun on a farmer than a card sheet across a town square at high noon, more likely to fire his rifle at a coyote than at a Comanche brave. Dust and tedium were the rule of a cowboy's work, as was enduring the worst of conditions to ensure top dollar for beef. Unlike the fiction, the real cowboy's life was far from romantic. Lon Taylor wrote that by all rights, he should have joined the hunters of Kentucky, the whalers, the flatboatmen, the plainsmen, and all of the other American types who briefly caught the popular imagination, were popularized in the stage and in song, and were then forgotten. But the open-range cowboy was never forgotten. The reason the cowboy endured while those other professions were forgotten is that after the death of his cowboy friend Texas Jack, Buffalo Bill Cody refused to let the public forget. Where once a lone cowboy rode with Buffalo Bill across the prairies of Nebraska, now hundreds of cowboys followed his footsteps as he charged in the spectacle of the Wild West. While once a single cowboy stood on stage and twirled his lasso, now a legion of men demonstrated cowboy skills for audiences worldwide. Not content to show them the embodiment of his cowboy friend, Buffalo Bill ensured that Texas Jack's experience as a cowboy was enshrined in show programs, handed out to millions of men, women, and children visiting the Wild West at stops in cities across America and throughout Europe. From its inaugural show in 1883, and in long stands at New York's Madison Square Garden in 1886, Queen Victoria's 1887 Diamond Jubilee in London, and Chicago's Columbian Exposition in 1893, the Wild West show programs contained a section titled simply The Cowboy, written by Texas Jack in the summer of 1877. The Cowboy began the piece that introduced the profession to so many eager spectators. How often spoken of, how falsely imagined, how greatly despised were not known, how little understood. I've been there considerable. With descriptions of stampedes and storms, cowboys singing to restless steers at night and cow scents, Omohundro describes a profession requiring the patience of Job and peopled by ambitious, adventurous, and rebellious young men, taught at school to admire the deceased little Georgie Washington in exploring adventures, though not equaling him in cherry tree goodness. How many of these brave cowboys never finish, Jack wonders in conclusion, but mark the trail with their silent graves, no one can tell. But when Gabriel toots his horn, the Chisholm Trail will swarm with cowboys. Howsomever, we'll all be there, let's hope, for a happy trip when we say to this planet, adios. In searching for a significant example of the kind of man that Buffalo Bill, Jayhawker, soldier, hunter, and scout, would elevate above all other professions in his simulacrum of the real West, presented as absolute historical truth to huge audiences across the world, one need look no further than John B. Texas Jack Omohundro, Cowboy. Perhaps the breadth of cowboy adventures in literature and film can also be attributed to the well-publicized exploits of Texas Jack, and it's easy to see the ways in which Buffalo Bill chose to honor his old friend. Years before Lakota warriors traveled with the Wild West, Texas Jack led the Pawnee on their annual summer buffalo hunt and invited Donald McKay and his daughter Minnie, Warm Springs Indians, to join his show. Before Cody's show sat in residence at the entrance of the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, Texas Jack set up a western-themed hotel, saloon, and shooting gallery at the 1876 Philadelphia Centennial. Before Cody and Dr. Carver launched the Wild West show in 1883, Texas Jack and Carver displayed their skills with rifle, pistol, and bow and arrows at a series of exhibitions in 1878. Texas Jack explored the new Yellowstone Park in 1874 with the Earl of Dunraven, 
blazed a new trail into the park from the southeast in 1877 and rescued tourists from an attack by Nez Perce fleeing army troops through the park in 1878, all well before Cody established the town that bears his name east of the park today. In 1873, Jack married his beautiful co-star, the peerless Giuseppina Morlacci, an Italian prima ballerina who was the most famous dancer in the world, having introduced the can-can to America in 1868. Jack led western hunts for aristocrats like the Earl of Dunraven, Sir John Ray Reed, and Count Otto Frank, all significant figures in the coming boom of the American cattle industry. He scouted for General Terry in pursuit of Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull and the aftermath of Custer's defeat at Little Bighorn or Greasy Grass. He surprised Thomas Edison one night in a Wyoming hotel, shooting a weather vane on a train station from Edison's hotel window to prove he was, quote, the boss pistol shot of the West. If the life of the average cowboy was trail dust and tedium, Texas Jacks was never short on excitement and adventure. It's little wonder it took scores of cowboys to replace this one man in Buffalo Bill's show. Louis Warren points out that William Cody seldom spoke of death or of people who had died. In all his correspondence, there's barely a mention of any deceased friends or acquaintances. He wrote no poignant words about Wild Bill Hickok, Sitting Bull, or Nate Salisbury. No matter how tragic their deaths, he seldom spoke of the loss. The exception to this role is John Omohundro. On September 5, 1908, 28 years after Texas Jack's death in Leadville, Colorado, the loss still weighed heavy on Cody's mind. That evening, Cody assembled the entire cast of his Wild West at the grave of his cowboy friend. With the sun setting behind 14,000-foot Mount Massive, Cody and his Wild West troop gathered under the tall pines of Evergreen Cemetery to pay tribute to Texas Jack. A reporter for the local Herald Democrat wrote, that if the spirit of Texas Jack were able to hover over the little mound that contains his mortal remains, he would have been gratified by the ceremonies in honor of his memory. They were the kind of ceremonies that his plain, rough, honest character would have asked could he have chosen. Brief, simple, and unaffected, but oh how impressive. A reverend offered a prayer, and Cody stepped forward to say a few words about his friend. Picture the scene. The silver-haired showman stands next to the pine slab, marking his old partner's final resting place. Around him are hundreds of locals, and next to him stands the reverend who conducted the service and the professor who led the brass band at Omaha Hunter's funeral procession 28 years earlier. Members of Cody's Wild West show stand arrayed in their costumes. A dozen cavalrymen form a rough semicircle. Some of these men, like their leader Buffalo Bill, served the Union during the Civil War, fighting on the opposite side of the battlefield from the former Confederate soldier they now commemorated. Representatives of the Ute and Sioux tribes, also part of Cody's honorage, stand tall in war paint and feather headdresses as they listen to words spoken about a man who claimed Powhatan lineage, hunted with the Pawnee, and fought against Comanche, Sioux, Nez Perce, and Cheyenne. Russian Cossack hunters, Japanese warriors, British cavalry, Arab riders, and German horsemen, each in full show garb, have come to pay their respects. A report in the local Leadville newspaper captures best the largest constituent group of men gathered for the ceremony. Impressed by the ceremony, second only to Colonel Cody himself, was the crowd of cowboys, whose experiences on the plains have been similar to those of the dead friend of their present-day chieftain. These men felt that the old scout was one of them. To them, the service was of greater import than to those whose life has been spent in some other pursuit. Tears welled to the eyes of many of these strong-muscled, large-hearted men. It was one of their comrades who they were honoring, a man who they knew and whose life was their life, though they had never seen him. Here, then, are the cowboys of the Wild West, come to honor one of their own, the first of their kind. These men shared with Texas Jack the common bond of the trail, hours spent breathing the dust of the herd, nights filled with stories shared by campfire and invented verse sung to restless dogies, tedious days and weeks broken only by the adrenaline rush of high river crossing, murderous rustler, and deadly stampede. Here stood the second generation of cowboy stars, held dear in America's hearts as the rescuers of embattled settlers and the embodiment of the frontier man, 
acknowledging the first of their kind. Cody removes his ever-present wide-brimmed Stetson, his famous locks now silvered and significantly thinned with age. He clutches the hat before him and begins to speak. My friends, perhaps many of you do not know this man who we have gathered to honor. No doubt you would like to know something of him, who was one of my dearest and most intimate friends. John B. Omohundro, better known as Texas Jack, was a Virginian by birth. The blood of the Powhatan Indians flowed in his veins. He was of proud and noble birth. During the Civil War, he was a member of the Cavalry Command under Colonel Jeb Stewart of the Confederate Army. He was one of his most trusted and faithful scouts and performed almost invaluable service for him. After the war, he drifted westward and located in Texas, where he took up the hazardous work of a cowboy. He was one of the original Texas cowboys when life on the plains was a hardship and a trying duty. When they began to drive the cattle to the northern country, he engaged in that occupation, following the herds northward and returning after each trip for another herd. Finally, he located at North Platte, Nebraska. It was there that I first met him. He was an expert trailer and scout. I soon recognized this and tried to secure his appointment in United States service. But the authorities were unwilling to hire discharged Confederate scouts, so I had to take the matter to the Secretary of War. After much persuasion, I was given permission to hire him. Here, Cody's voice breaks. In this capacity, I learned to know him, to respect his bravery and ability. He was a whole-souled, brave, generous, a good-hearted man. Later, he and I went east to go into show business. He was the first to do a lasso act upon the stage. After a short career with the show, we again went west. That was in 1876 when the Sioux War was being fought. About the same time, General Custer was killed, and we had to take part in many important engagements. After the Indian Wars, we returned east and again went onto the stage. It was during tours of the large cities he met and married Mademoiselle Morlicky, the famous dancer who later traveled with him. After I left him, he and she continued to travel. They came to Leadville, where she was engaged as a performer. Become at becoming attached to the place, my friend and his wife remained for a while. It was while here that he was stricken with pneumonia, which was then prevalent. He succumbed and was buried here under this mound by his many friends. Cody paused to gather himself before continuing. Jack was an old friend of mine and a good one. Instead of this board which now marks his grave, we will soon have erected a more substantial monument, one more worthy of a brave and a good man. Cody's eyes followed the sweep of his hand past the board, beyond the pine trees, and towards Mount Massive towering in the fading orange sunset. A slight breeze plays through the tops of the trees as they cast long shadows over the assembled party. Cody takes a moment to wipe his brimming eyes with his handkerchief. He looks out over the assembled citizens of Leadville and then to the cast of his Wild West show, the dozens of Native Americans, soldiers, scouts, and cowboys that are employees, cast members, and friends. He places a hand on the grave marker he means to replace and returns the Stetson once again to his head. May he rest in peace. As the band plays Nearer My God to Thee, Cody places a wreath of flowers on the grave of his old friend. He mumbles a few brief words of his own and then mounts his horse and rides away. Nearly a decade later, on January 6, 1917, Buffalo Bill rode through Leadville for the final time on a return visit from Glenwood Springs to Denver. Too weak to leave his train car, he sat up in bed when told he was in Leadville, telling his daughter about the grave of Texas Jack, his best friend and his partner. Four days later, Buffalo Bill was dead. Few men are truly remembered in the way that America and the world remember Buffalo Bill. America largely forgot about Texas Jack Omohundro, the cowboy who first popularized the profession and introduced the lasso to the stage the cowboy whose description of his life on the open range spoke from the programs handed out at each stop of Buffalo Bill's Wild West, the cowboy who saved Buffalo Bill's life. America remembered the names of the legendary lawmen and outlaws, of the braves and bandits, the soldiers and the scouts, but forgot the name of its most important open range cowboy. America forgot, but Buffalo Bill remembered. 
and because Buffalo Bill remembered his best friend, his co-star, the man that saved his life, his part of the plans for life, Texas Jack, the world remembers the cowboy.